Amen. Amen. Thank you, Becky, for leading us into worship today. It's good to be with you here in the house of the Lord on this second Sunday of Advent. We're thankful for your presence today. Um, We are recording this not on Sunday. We are here on a Thursday morning uh, recording this service early um, because we are trying to be extra careful with the COVID crisis during this time. Um, And so we hope that wherever you are today, that you uh, are experiencing the the peace of Advent. And we'll talk a little bit more about that throughout our time together today. Uh, Today is also the first Sunday of December. And on the first Sunday of each month, we uh, take communion together. We we observe the, the, the Lord's Supper. And so if you would like to participate with us, then we invite you at some point during the service today to go to your kitchen and find a piece of bread and something to drink so that you can uh, join with us as we remember um, the, the, the last night before Jesus was crucified, uh, how he disciples. And so we invite you to join us for that. Uh, because it is uh, one of those days in which we are um, trying to, to limit the number of people who are in the sanctuary. Um, we are blessed today to have uh, Becky with us and, and also Eric, um, who's uh, up in the, in the sound booth leading, uh, leading worship through making sure that you can hear us. Mitten is, is leading the camera for the most part, but he's also here to uh, lead us in our call to worship. And Mary Lee Inneberg will read our scripture here uh, in, a, in a moment. But as we continue in worship today, we invite you to, to worship with us and to join us in our call to worship and our Advent reading, which Mitten will come and lead us in now. Thank you, Mitten. Good morning, church family. Let us prepare our hearts for worship. Our lists are long, even in the strange mess where we live these days, and we want to do it right. We want to be safe, but we want to be able to enjoy the season. We've got work to do to put the right thing what has gone wrong, to heal what is broken, to mend the relationships, and to prepare for the company that will come. So, we light these candles as a sign of our faith that the God we worship is not far from us and that we can clear the way for God to come and dwell within us. We light these candles in faith that company is coming. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Well, you have said that whenever there are two or three gathered in your name, you are present among them, Lord. But we know that we cannot be physically present at this moment. But we know by your spirit that we are together and united in spirit, Lord. And we pray that you accept our worship today and you hear our prayers, Lord. We especially raise up Mike as he's just returned from the hospital. We pray for healing, Lord, and we also pray for strength. We pray for Elaine, Lord, as she is taking care of Mike so she can get proper discernment, Lord. Heal the people, Lord, those who are suffering from COVID. We raise up Joel up to you, Lord, and we pray for his recuperation as well. And we also pray for the healing of this nation, both physically as well as spiritually, Lord. As the nation seems to be divided right now, Lord, we pray that you bring healing, Lord. You have brought healing to the nations from generations, Father. And there is nothing impossible for you, Lord. And we know that you will be able to bring this country together, be united and move forward as a strong nation, Lord. We raise the service up to you, Lord. Accept our praise and our worships, Father. And we pray for Pastor David John. We pray that he is led by your spirit to bring us this message that will 
speak to us in a way that we want to hear the message today, Lord, that it may serve us according to the situations that we are in, Father. We pray that you be with us through this service and ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for leading us in worship today, Mitten, and every week as you work so dutifully to make sure that people can see this worship opportunity. Um, we're thankful for your, for your work and for your presence and your leadership. As we continue in worship, we sing our hymn of praise, Lo, how a rose air blooming. And uh, we ask that you join with us with, uh, and sing with your hearts in praise to God as we sing this hymn this morning. every load. That's what our Savior does for us. And today we are going to be talking about how through the incarnation we receive a Savior. Mary Lee is going to come and read two passages of Scripture now for us that speak about the Savior. And so as we continue, may we hear these words and may they be words that Although we've heard them before, may they be read anew and heard anew in our hearts and in our minds today. Our first reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. But just when Joseph had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, 
For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And now from the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people, To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for reading, Mary Lee. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, we come before you today in recognition that we need you. We need you to guide our hearts and to guide our minds. We need you to guide our lives because, Lord, we recognize that Although we try, we can't do this. We can't live this life alone. We need you. We need each other. And yes, Lord, we need a Savior. Thankfully, Lord, we know that our Savior has come. Our Savior has come to the world. And this Savior is able to heal us and to restore us. But Lord, oftentimes we forget that. Sometimes we deny it. Maybe we don't deny it with our lips, maybe we don't say it out loud, but we deny that Jesus can actually save us, heal us, Help us. And so, Lord, we seek you this day. On the second Sunday of Advent, as we worship together, as we think about the coming of the Christ child yet again into our hearts and into our lives, we know, Lord, that there are so many things that we can be doing for your kingdom. But, Lord... The first thing we have to do is bring our burdens to You and allow You to shoulder them. Because You remind us that Your yoke is easy and Your burden is light. Therefore, we should come and bring our burdens to You. So help us, Lord. Help us not to be too proud to seek your help. We're thankful for the ways in which you have taught us to live and to love. And we're thankful for the way in which you taught us to pray when you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Last Sunday, we began our conversation about the incarnation of Jesus. And we discussed how the person of Jesus fulfills this Davidic covenant, this promise that God had between God and David, that, that God would use the lineage of David to usher in a kingdom of which there would be no end. God would send a Messiah to God's people, yet the Messiah the people received was not what they expected. The king was focused on peace and justice, righteousness, and lifting up the downtrodden. This Messiah was focused on the kingdom of God rather than the kingdom of now. This is obviously a major reason for the incarnation of God to introduce a new way of living. Yet the incarnation is more than that. Because of the incarnation, we also receive a Savior. In the passage that Mary Lee read from Matthew, Joseph, uh, Mary's betrothed, is, con is confronted by an angel. This angel is Gabriel, who shares with Joseph the news of Mary's pregnancy, saying, Joseph, do not be afraid to fulfill your commitment to Mary. She is doing the Lord's work and has conceived a child from the Holy Spirit. His name shall be Jesus, and He will save His people, God's people, from their sins. Now, I imagine that this news was hard for Joseph to comprehend for a number of reasons. One, he was in the presence of an angel. And what do we find every time that we see an angel in the New Testament? What do they say? Do not be afraid. They must have been pretty scary looking figures. The second thing is that his betrothed wife was going to bear a child that was not his. Imagine that. Imagine that someone comes and tells you that your wife, the one that is betrothed to you, is going to have a child, but that child is not yours. Then this, this angel tells him that the child would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. What? It's hard to imagine. And finally, this child would save people from their sins. Yet Joseph, he hears the word of this angel and fulfills his commitment to Mary... He marries her, he supports her, he takes her to Bethlehem for the census, and when the child is born, he calls him Jesus. And this name, Jesus, which we call our Lord, is an Angli anglicized version of a Greek name. But Jesus actually derives from the Hebrew, the word the, the name for Jesus actually comes from Hebrew, and that word, that name is Yeshua. And Yeshua derives from the words Yahweh, meaning God, and the word Yasha, which means to deliver or to save. Therefore, the name Yeshua, Jesus, literally means God delivers or God saves. But what did the people need to be delivered from? What did these people need to be delivered from? Even more personally, I want to ask you a question. Do you need saving? As modern day Christians, we like to ask the question, are you saved? But what does that mean? Well, people use the word saved in a variety of ways. For some, it can mean that someone has professed faith in Christ. It can mean that someone has been or is going to be baptized. It can mean that someone is confident in their eternal security in heaven. It can mean that someone is not going to hell. But what does it mean for Jesus to save us? Well, if we use the Bible as our guide... We find that the New Testament also uses the word saving for a variety of situations. Infirmed people 
are healed of their limitations. Hopeless people are delivered from their despair. The disciples are saved from impending death on a boat, and people are forgiven of their transgressions. So through the incarnation of God, Jesus, God saves or delivers. God comes to address all of the needs which hold people back from fulfilling God's intentions for their lives. Sometimes the stumbling blocks are caused by their disobedience or our disobedience. And sometimes the stumbling blocks are just there. They're just there. Yet in both situations, we are in need of a Savior to help guide us. One of the great challenges for the 21st century church is to see our Savior as one who has come not only to save us from our sins, but also to deliver us from the things we cannot control. Adam Hamilton, a Methodist pastor in Kansas, says, For some people it feels like sin is the only thing they ever hear about in church. He says, I want to be clear, if all you hear about in church on Sunday is sin, you're probably in the wrong church. But on the other side, if you never hear about sin in your church, you may also be at the wrong church. Because the good news of Jesus is not that we are sinners, but that he is our Savior. Let me repeat that for you. The good news of Jesus is not that we are sinners, but that He is our Savior. We all struggle, you and I, with sin in our lives. This is a fundamental part of who we are, and we miss the mark. The the word sin in Greek is hamartia, which means to miss the mark or to stray from the path. And as a result... When we miss the mark, we feel that guilt and shame, and we begin to see ourselves as unworthy of God's forgiveness or of forgiveness from others. And so what do we do? Slowly, slowly we begin to fade away into the shadows, hoping to escape the suffering. It's in these moments that we need to lean on our Savior, the one who has been sent to help us, to save us, to deliver us from the bondage of shame and redeem us, restore us, reconcile us, justify us, and to forgive us, to walk in newness of life. It's this grace of God which can cover all of our shame and help us to move forward as children of God. But I must admit that grace that is offered to us comes at a cost. It requires an act of sacrificial love by our Savior. In his book, Uh, costly discipleship, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin. And grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You were bought at a price. And what has cost God much cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, 
but delivered him up for us. Costly grace, Bonhoeffer says, is the incarnation of God. We need, you and I, to be saved from our sinfulness. And Jesus, God incarnate, delivers us from our sinfulness. We need to remember that. That because of the incarnation, we receive a Savior who is able to deliver us from our sin. Yet that's not the only thing that He delivers us from. As we, in, as we mentioned earlier, our Savior also delivers us from hopelessness and despair. Well, what does that mean? I don't know about you, but there have been times in my life when I felt pretty down, pretty out. Times when I've been so discouraged that I didn't know where to turn. Now, thankfully, I have to admit, those times have been few and far between, but they've been there. And I'm sure you've had those moments, too. But in each of those dark moments, we've been reminded, I've been reminded, of the love of God for me. Sisters and brothers in Christ... The Savior of the world, God incarnate, loves you. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor power nor depth nor anything else in creation, anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love is unconditional, unending, and it will never let us go. Nothing can stop that. Nothing can stop that love, not even death itself. In this hellacious year that we've experienced, 1.5 million people around our world have died from a pandemic that no one ever expected or anticipated. Countless people have died because of violent acts. Unspeakable tragedies have occurred. We think about the fires in Australia, the fires out west, the hurricanes. There have been so many things that have happened this year, and, and every time we turn, something else bad happens. And I don't know about you, but there are times at which I've wondered if the incarnate God can deliver us once again. But brothers and sisters, I'm here to remind you that if you're struggling with that idea right now, let me remind you that our Savior has overcome every challenge put in His way. Every challenge put in His way. Even death itself. And so, brothers and sisters, we may be discouraged. We may feel down and out. But I can tell you this much. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future, He lives within my heart. The incarnation of Christ sends us a king, a Messiah, and it sends us a Savior. 
Will you allow the incarnate God to save you today from whatever is holding you back? Whether it be something, some transgression that you've had that's been gnawing at you for your entire life or for years and years, are you, allow, are you w- willing to, to give that burden over, over to God? If you are, let me tell you, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Your sin is wiped out. The slate is clean because of who our Savior is. Maybe it's because you're feeling down and out. Maybe it's because you've lost your job or you're worried about losing your job. Maybe it's because you don't know where to turn because all the things that are going wrong in our world. Let me tell you, Jesus, God saves God delivers, will deliver you too. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so today, brothers and sisters, may we believe that, may we cling to that, and may we seek the Savior who is able to heal us and deliver us from all things in our life. Amen. Amen. I mentioned to you at the beginning of our service that we are going to gather for communion now. And as we prepare ourselves for the table, I invite you to go and get your elements if you haven't already done so. But we'll also sing a hymn that prepares us for the table. It's to the tune of O Wally Wally. It's new words, though. And so as we gather around the table of the Lord... Let us sing these words as we prepare. Brothers and sisters, we come to this table now. This table that was set for us by our Savior, even Jesus Christ our Lord. This table was set years and years ago in an upper room in Jerusalem during the week of the Passover where Jesus gathered with His disciples on the night before He was crucified. He had, was preparing to be betrayed by one of His disciples, one of His beloved disciples. And He gathered with them up in this room. They ate a meal together. He washed their feet. And after they had eaten the meal, Jesus uh, just paused for a moment. He took 
some bread and he broke it in half and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And he passed it around to his disciples and they ate. Then, after they had done that, he took a common cup of wine and he lifted it up towards heaven and he said, this cup represents a new covenant which is in my blood. Do it as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Brothers and sisters, as you sit there wherever you are, I want you to know that Jesus has prepared this table for you. You didn't have to do anything for this table other than to go and get the elements yourself. Everything else has been prepared. And so wherever you are, if Christ is a part of your life, if you believe that Christ can save you from everything that is holding you back from living the life that God has created for you, I invite you to partake of this meal. For the next couple of moments, Becky's going to be playing some music, and I want you to take time to consider this table and to remember this is Christ's body, this is Christ's blood for you. Amen. We come to a time of response. And as we come to this time in our worship service, I encourage you to respond. Perhaps you need to respond for the first time in your life and make the decision to allow the Savior of the world to save you from the things that are holding you back. We celebrate that decision with you. And if you want to make it known, you should make it known. Let someone know. Feel free to reach out to me or to someone else in the church and let them know of your decision. Maybe you've made that decision long ago, but for whatever reason you've walked away, you've, you've, you've strayed from the path. Let me assure you, that path will be shown to you again because of our Savior. All you have to do is ask for Christ to guide you, to lead you back. Perhaps you've been worshiping with our church for a while and are, uh, find it to be the place where you feel like God is leading you to worship and to, and to join. If Christ is calling you to do that, we invite you to do so. Whatever the decision may be, whatever Christ is calling you to, may you respond as we sing our hymn of response, which is to the tune of It Came Upon a Midnight Clear, O God, we hear your word of grace. Let us sing and respond. Oh. 
psalmist tells us this, that love with faith will soon embrace, that peace and justice kiss. Then all will sing out God is good, then harvest will increase, and we will listen, loving Lord, as you proclaim your peace. The world proclaims a different word, how can these things be so? For all around this hurting earth, the seeds of discord grow. When war and conflict, greed and pride would claim our loyalty, too often we have turned aside from what we're called to be. Lord, show us what we're called to as we await your day. For waiting well means serving to and walking in Christ's way. Now by your Spirit may we be words of grace. Grace and justice both shall meet and love and faith It's time, let's pray for our tree. Heavenly Father, every good thing comes from you, Lord. We believe in your word, and we also believe your word that says that God rejoices in a cheerful giver. Lord, our hearts are filled with gratitude. Thanks for the breath we take. Thanks for the food that you bring to our table. Thanks for the clothes and the shelter that you have provided us, Lord. At this moment, help us to be the cheerful giver that your heart desires, Lord, that we may be able to give not under any compulsion or obligation, but give cheerfully so that the work of your gospel may be spread all across, Lord, so that your work that Christ established 2,000 years ago may continue till his second coming, Lord. At this moment, we also want to raise up people, those who do not have food, Lord, those who are homeless, those who are on the streets and those who don't have maybe proper things to warm up in this cold weather, Lord. Be with them, Father, and help us to reach out your light to them as and whenever we can. Bless our giving, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
That was beautiful. Thank you, Becky, for, for leading us in worship um, today. We're, we're thankful for, for your beautiful music. As we come to the conclusion of our service, I have a few announcements I'd like to share with you. First, uh, today we will, or I guess on Sunday, uh, we will gather for Sunday school, and we're going to meet at 1145 because uh, we, we don't have to break down everything and turn off all the lights and everything up here. So we'll meet at 1145 for Sunday school, and you can join us uh, by going on our website and clicking on the Zoom link for uh, study together online. We also have our Tuesday night um, uh, discussion on the Incarnation. If you'd like to join us for that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, there are a couple of other announcements. It's not too late to order a poinsettia or a poinsettia. Um, and so those will be delivered to your door. They're $20 each. And if you'd like to order one, you need to get your email or you need to get in your order as quickly as possible uh, because we want to uh, deliver those to you on the 13th, which is next Sunday. And so if you'd like to get the, a poinsettia, please, please let us know by Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday would be great, uh, Tuesday the 8th, and so we hope that you will um, participate in that. We also want to give thanks for the wreaths that are on the outside doors. Those were given by Karen Borgstad, and so we, uh, we thank Karen for her gift, and uh, we, we are uh, enjoying putting out the Christmas spirit in the community. If you drive by the church and you see a, a, a stable, we're not bringing Journey to Bethlehem back this year, but we are putting this stable out and we're going to put a manger out so that people can remember what this season is all about. And so if you and your family want to come to the church and, and stand around the stable and consider the, you know, what we're celebrating this year, we invite you to do so. Try not to do it uh, with a lot of other people, but if you want to come with your family and do that, it should be a safe way for you to celebrate this season. And uh, we look forward to ways in which we will continue to, to, to change that stable throughout the, the Advent time. I want to thank Eric Hogan for his hard work putting that together and, uh, and for the opportunity that people have to come and, and to worship the king in the stable. I believe that's all of the announcements that I have for today. It's been a, a good day to join with you, and we're thankful for your presence. Continue to keep those uh, in your prayers, the people who are suffering from this illness. Uh, as of yesterday, we had the highest death toll in one day uh, throughout the entire pandemic. And uh, I, I, as I mentioned to our folks on Tuesday night during the discussion, I don't normally tell you things that you have to do, um, and I, 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 I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you this much. This is a serious, serious illness. People are dying one person per minute in the United States. We have a responsibility, you and I, to do everything in our power to keep people safe. And how do I know that? Because Jesus tells us, what are the two greatest commandments? To love God with everything you got and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so if you love yourself, love your neighbor enough to put on a mask, be safe, and to, and to do things wisely. As we continue through this time, may we remember that our Savior calls us to be the people of deliverance. To share that we have been delivered from the things that have held us back in our past so that we can walk in newness of life, and that they can too. And so, brothers and sisters, go, be a delivered person. Your sins have been forgiven. The slate has been wiped clean. You are a child of God. Go and live as a child of God today and every day. Amen. Becky's going to lead us out in our, with a postlude. We look forward to gathering again with you next Sunday. Be safe until then, and take care.